Let's go ahead and open our Bibles and let's turn to the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter number 9 is is where we will find our text this evening. Straight out of God's Word. Some men that I believe discovered that God was enough. Ezra chapter number 9, if you've found it, let's go ahead and stand out of reverence for the reading of God's Word. Ezra chapter number 9. And we'll begin reading in verse number 1. Ezra chapter number 9 and verse number 1. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. And when I heard these things, I rent my garment, my mantle, and I plucked off the hair of my head and my beard and sat down, astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of God, of the God of Israel, because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat, astonished, until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness, And having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees, and I spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, and said, O my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to Thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespasses grown up unto the heavens, Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered unto the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to the spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. And now for a little space of grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape. And to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage. But he hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. Father, I pray that you would give us insight into Ezra's heart here tonight. For of a truth, Lord, as I read this passage, so many of the words resonate with the things that I see in my own land concerning our leaders, concerning our people, concerning the despair that creeps into our own hearts. But yet my desire, Lord, is to respond with faith. Lord, my desire is to respond as your great men responded, to respond as those that were suffering as David suffered and as Daniel suffered and as, as, as Ezra suffered and as Nehemiah suffered and as Jeremiah suffered and as Paul did and as Peter did and as the many men that you have used so powerfully, Lord, so use us here. But Lord, I pray that we would start the same place that they did. And I pray that you would give us a a guidebook to that this evening. That that guidebook would not just be a, a description of the process that must be undergone, but rather, Lord, that it would be a, a compelling of the heart to draw near to you in faith believing. 
And Lord, I pray that you would now help me in this task tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Tonight I would like to preach about the prayer life of a patriot. I I like to consider myself a patriot and I reserve the right to define the term myself. I don't know why that word has become a curse word, a patriot, a derogatory term, a patriot. So I'll just stick to the definition given in the dictionary instead of the definition given by the left. The dictionary defines the word patriot as one who has a love for or devotion to one's country. I have a love for this land. I'm devoted to it. I can't defend all of its actions because I cringe at the thought of some of the decisions that have been made by previous administrations and will be made by this one. But I am nonetheless a patriot. My heart grieves out of concern for what will become in this land. And I think, by the way, that that is a biblical response. Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 2 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. And I cannot speak to the character of, of the man that was sworn into office today. I I cannot say that he is of better moral fiber or of better moral character than was President Trump. But I do believe that I have an obligation, regardless of his character, whether it be better or worse, to examine his policy and take it at face value and feeling that we are in for dangerous times. But I still love this country. So what does a patriot do? And how does a patriot handle this in prayer? I I look to this passage and I see another man who loved his country. You see, just as I preached last week, I'll remind you again this week that... The backdrop of political adversity is the primary backdrop of the Bible. So we should be able to find truth in the Bible that pertains not not in a in a sideways application way, but in a direct confrontation way to what we're dealing with. We will find immediate parallels to the political system that we are facing, the cultural changes that have now taken place in our nation. We will see them in plain black and white on the pages of our Bible. And I look at Ezra, a man that loved his nation, a a patriot nonetheless, who wanted God's hand on that place and on that nation. And although Israel is not America, and America is not Israel, and there are promises given to Israel specifically that are not intended to be fulfilled in America, I look at how he responded And I say, Lord, put that response in my heart as well. To draw you into the correlations in case you were sleeping or not thinking through our current environment while we were reading the text, I let remind you some of Ezra's observations. First and foremost, we see in verse number one, uh, the Bible says, Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations. And then it it names a number of people, the the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. And if I could sum all of these ites into one thing uh, that is dominant here in this text is what they are saying is uh, that the uniqueness of Israel being that it was consecrated to follow the Lord, it was separated from the paganism of the day and was sanctified for the purpose of God's use and what the princes are now saying to Ezra and Ezra is now observing in the land is that this, this nation which was committed to following the Lord and and submitting itself to God's authority is now following after the same pattern of every other pagan nation. That's what he's seeing. 
he, he's seeing that the ones most complicit in this act are the leaders themselves. It says in verse number 2, at the end of the verse, it says, Yea, the hand of the princes and the rulers hath been chief in this trespass. In other words, this was not just something that he saw among the, the people of his nation, but it's something that he saw being chief in the rulers, those leading it. Now, I want to make a very clear distinction here right now, is that in this democratic republic which we are in called America, we vote these people in. And regardless of how we may feel about some of the irregularities regarding this election, there is, there is no doubt that there is a massive undercurrent of people, not an undercurrent, a tsunami of people in this nation that are increasingly more godless and they are voting that way. And our leadership is a reflection of our nation. What is a patriot supposed to do? Because I can't abandon my red, white, and blue. But I, yet I, I cannot abandon what God has called me to be. And my pursuit of Him, for my pursuit of Him should always be greater than my patriotism or my pursuit of this nation but in, in a sense he did not he did not call us home yet he called us to be salt and light in this world so how then should a patriot respond and, and I look to to Ezra and, and here is what Ezra does he says in verse number four then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel. Now I got to stop right there. Because I see another parallel between what Ezra is experiencing and what we are experiencing. Because if I could be uh, honest with you, I see more people here tonight than I saw here a year ago. God's people are still gathering, aren't they? And even in Ezra's day, when he looked and he saw the depravity of his nation and the leadership which were, uh, well, uh, uh, which were leading the charge in, in his instant, uh, and it seems like, like it, it, we are so quick to put all of our eyes on, on the wickedness in this, this slide towards humanism and this slide towards paganism and this slide towards, towards godlessness and this sprinting away uh, from the, the hard, fast, unmovable truth of God's word that we forget that there's still a group of people that the Bible describes in verse number four as those that trembled at the words of the God of Israel and look around ladies and gentlemen regardless of the fact of how alone you may feel out there look around as we assemble ourselves in here we I pray every single one of us are still part of that fellowship of the unashamed but we still tremble at the word of the Lord that when he speaks, we listen. And when he moves, we beg to be part of that movement. And here we are. What then does a patriot do? We gather together, don't we? Interesting how the gathering of a church has been under attack unlike it has ever been under since the founding of this nation. It's almost like there's some power of darkness that we cannot see that's orchestrating it all. So are you saying that President Joe Biden is the Antichrist? No. I don't think that for one minute. But you think I'm, I am blind enough that I don't see the hand of what is at play? Oh, may we open our eyes. What then is a patriot to do? And here is what it says. That when they gathered themselves together in, in verse number four, those that believed. It says in verse number five. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness. And having rent my garment and my mantle. Well, that's what we've been doing a lot here recently, isn't it? <laughs> oh, this is so heavy. 
And no, I haven't ripped any clothes yet. I haven't ripped any clothes yet. But I've been continually trying to rise up out of heaviness. <laughs> Lord, help me. But then notice what he does when he gets, gets spiritual about it. In the evening sacrifice, I rose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garments and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said. He began to pray. This is the prayer life of a patriot. How do we pray for our country? How do we ask God to do something that it seems like God shouldn't do? Because I see the wickedness and if I see it with the eyes of my flesh... Oh, the wickedness that is before Him. How then do we pray? Do we pray judgment upon this land and say, Lord, if you're going to do it, just do it now. And we'll talk about that on Sunday as I preach on the temptation of fire. So how do we then pray? Well, here is how Ezra prayed. Here is how this patriot prayed. He says in verse number 6, And said... Oh, my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. Notice this, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens The first thing that this patriot does when he decides to set his face towards heaven and to pray for his nation is to admit the fact that there are things that he must confess. Confession is absolutely essential to the patriot's prayer life. To admit the fact that there are wrongdoings that we are a part of individually and that as the collective of our nation, as we go before God in representation of that country, that here we are representing a nation that is turning its back on God. And it is not our job to make excuse for that nation, nor is it our job just to say, oh, look at them. But what does this patriot do he says this is our transgression he owns the confession himself in verse number six you see that phrase our that first person possessive plural pronoun no that may have been a lot to handle except for the english um, majors in here but here's what it means is part of a collective that he himself was joined in as equal partnership. And that's why this is such a grievous thing. Some of the decisions that our nation is making is that it means that there are things that on behalf of that nation I must confess because that is part of my nation. I think confession is probably the most short-changed part of our prayer. And unfortunately, from what I see in the Bible, confession is that that entry gate almost into prayer. Doesn't the Bible say that if we regard iniquity in our heart, that He will not hear us? So why is it that we jump so quickly to making our petition and trying to make some kind of intercession, which we'll get to in just a moment, or anything else, if we don't first come to a place where we say, Dear God, I am guilty. My iniquity, my transgression, my sin, our our problem, our transgression are the words of Ezra. And when we come to God in prayer on behalf of our nation, like every God-believing patriot should do, we need to begin that prayer with absolute confession. Confession. 
This is our greatest problem in prayer so many times is we run to our heavenly father who wants to give us good gifts and we see those shining riches of his glory and we want to lay hold of them without having that same, oh, woe is me experience that Isaiah had when he saw the Lord high and lifted up and bowed himself before him. And that same man, David, uh, that, that wrote so beautifully in the Psalms of the riches of his mercy and declaring that his mercy endureth forever had the same thought, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Why is that? Because he came with a spirit of confession. Here is a word that we often read over quickly in our King James Bible, which we ought to retain with passion. Every word is there inspired for a purpose. And the very first word of this prayer was not a word at all, but an expression. Oh, oh, oh my God. It's an expression of conviction. It's an expression of despair. He had already described his, his position before God at the evening sacrifice. He arose from my heaviness and having my garment rent and my mantle. I fell upon my knees and I spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. And I can picture uh, this patriot Ezra before God having ripped his mantle and, and bowed down on his knees. And his words are, oh my God. There are eyewitness accounts of those that experienced one of the most powerful revivals in Europe, the Welsh Revival. And when asked about the Welsh Revival, he responded by, by explaining that the O oh returned to their prayers. If we're going to pray for this nation, there must be confession. In order for there to be confession, there must be ownership. Our transgression. Ours. Ours. I see that he was not intent to just settle for, for confession, but he went from confession to, to intercession. We see in, in, verse number, in verse number 7, he says, Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day. For our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hands of the kings of the land, to the sword, to captivity, to a spoil, and to confusion of, of face. As, as it is this day. And he's listing all of those things. And as he lists them, he's listing them with a heart of intercession. Uh, that this prayer might intercede into this space of punishment that the Lord has already poured out. And I find it so interesting that in this intercession, in this interceding, he's, he's desiring to get, in the, to get in the way. That is basically what intercession is. If you could imagine the wrath of God being ready to be poured out uh, on the, the sinful man. And yet someone steps in and gets in the way and says, no, please don't. That's what it means to intercede. To step into the, the middle of, to, to disrupt or defuse that process. Uh, the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter number 22, uh, one of the most popular verses in all the Bible. Uh, it says this in verse number 30. Uh, God speaking, he says, and I sought for a man among them that should make up a hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Uh, most of the time that you hear that preached, it is preached in the context of missions. And they are preaching that God is looking for a man to make up that hedge and stand in the gap. And the application of those messages is typically something like this, that God is looking for a man to go to a foreign land and to reach that foreign land. But really, that's not what is being said. It's Israel once again who has transgressed against God 
And he was looking for someone to stand up between God and the land to make intercession and to beg God for mercy. And you hear the most, the most heart-wrenching words in the Bible, and I found none. Because he found none, the very next verse in the Bible is, Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. And why did those things happen? Yes, it was because of their transgression. Yes, it was because of their iniquity. Yes, it was because a nation was sliding away from God, seemingly unstoppable. But there was a possibility of salvation. There was a possibility that the fire of that wrath would not be poured out. And that one thing that God was looking for was for someone to stand in the gap, someone to make intercession to someone for someone to beg God for his mercy but God found none I was reading and I was studying this, this matter of, of intercession and, and standing between, to, between God and, and the, the wrath that was rightfully deserved. And I found that there is one man in the Bible that exemplifies intercession more than any others. Maybe you've heard of him. His name is is Jesus. Did you know that the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse number 34 uh, it says who is he that condemneth? Well isn't there something that God should condemn? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there is none righteous. No not one. The Bible says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. In fact the same book that book of Romans says that there is none that doeth good. None that seeketh after God. And here we are miserable and dead in our our trespasses and sins deserving of the condemnation that should come to us by the hand of a wrathful God. But then, but then, the Bible says after asking that question, who is he that condemneth? It says, it is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Do you realize that when you intercede on behalf of a family member, on behalf of a loved one, on behalf of a coworker or a neighbor or a spouse or a nation, you are acting, exemplifying the work of Christ. If you want to be more Christ-like, we need to get involved in the work of intercessory prayer, seeing the wrath of God coming, seeing the judgment of God upon us, seeing the dangerous road that so many are speeding down, that we would find a prayer closet and a space of grace that we might confess our transgressions and our sins that we might get a hold of the ear of a loving, compassionate and holy God that he might find someone that's willing to stand in the gap of this nation. And see, when it comes to intercession... I think we ought also to intercede for our leaders. We have a new president today. That if you have not prayed yet for him. You are missing your purpose. The Christian patriot is more interested in praying for our leaders than just condemning them. And just in case we are remiss or forget, it was Paul who writes to Timothy and says, I exhort thee therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And, and the sentence doesn't end there. It's a semicolon. So the thought continues. And he, and he says this. After saying for all men. For kings. 
and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We need to be praying for our president, for our vice president. For all those people that we were praying against during the election, we better start praying for them now. Could you imagine if, if we prayed with such intercession before God that we actually had a revival in Congress? Could you imagine the White House press conferences? The press secretary has to move to the side as a tearful president steps to the podium and says, Oh God, help us. And they say, Well, that's impossible. Well, you don't know my God. Do you realize what he did to the wicked kings of the past? Was it not? Was it not Darius? I, I, I don't know why that doesn't feel just right. So you Bible scholars out there with um, Daniel, that king that threw him in the lion's den. Darius, was it not he that declared that this is the one true God? Was it not Nebuchadnezzar who looked into a fiery furnace and did not see the three that he threw in there, but saw the four, one like the Son of God? And when they came out, Nebuchadnezzar said, Don't touch them because their God is real. What do we know about Daniel? He was a man of prayer. What do we know about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were men of commitment. And if we could be men of commitment and men of prayer and women, if we could be people of commitment and prayer that we would pray for our president, for our leaders, for all those that are in authority and just as Ezra prayed and saw the need in his nation that we would be praying men and women. Prayers not of condemnation, but of intercession. Of intercession. And then lastly, I'll, I'll say this. And then I'll say a whole bunch more Sunday. It'll be great. You know, if, if we're going to have the prayer of a patriot, it, it needs to contain confession. It should contain intercession. And this is not an exhaustive list, but I like to stick with three points. I had four tonight, but I see your faces. So just petition. There's some things we should be requesting. But I feel that this is also needful. The prayer of a patriot includes thanksgiving. Look at verse number 8. In the midst of all of this, Ezra says, And now for a little space of grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in His holy place. It's an unusual statement. We'll speak about it in a moment. That our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage. But he hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia, which by the way were wicked men, to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. Now he's speaking of Judah and Jerusalem because those were the capital cities and the, and the capital province of, of his nation. Uh, but here we are praying on behalf of our nation. And, and I'll remind you that in, in this prayer, which included um, confession and, and intercession and, and petition, it, it also includes thanksgiving it includes thanksgiving 
And, and here is what he says at, at the end of, oh, I've got to find it with my eyes. Um, at, at the end of verse number eight, he says this, that our God may lighten our eyes. I, I think sometimes our eyes get so darkened of despair because we feel the winds of change coming and they are drafty and cold. And, and we close our eyes and we wince at the discomfort of them. But if we would just, just squint a little, if we would just look past this a little bit, we might see the same thing that Ezra saw. And now, for a little space of grace hath been showed of the Lord. I want you to know this. God doesn't need a big space. He just needs a little space. Just a little space. A little space where the Holy Spirit can get in and allow grace to operate and God's convicting power and the strength of His Word and the power of His Holy Spirit. If there's just a crack, just a window, just an opportunity, and make no bones about it, we've still got a bigger space of grace than what Ezra had. We still have a massive door of opportunity that most nations don't have. Uh, we've been praying for Daniel as he came out, not, not the Bible Daniel, but a missionary Daniel as he came out of China because his space got so small that he couldn't operate. But even at that, there is a remnant of believers even in that country that are continuing on in preaching the gospel and continuing on in prayer for their nation and continuing on to reach others with the cause of Jesus Christ in communist China. And look at the space we've got. Look at the space of grace that is still not yet closed. There are still people moving to Knoxville from all over the country. This city is bigger today than what it was a year ago, than what it was two years ago, than what it was three years ago. You know what that tells me? The space isn't getting smaller. It's getting bigger. Because with every soul is an opportunity. With every service is a chance. With every one you meet. Uh, whether it's a neighbor you've been working on for a while or a man whose name escapes your memory, there's still a space for the grace of God. And when we pray, you better not forget that. You better not forget that space of grace that God has supplied. And here is how he likens that space of grace. He, he makes this peculiar statement. In verse number 8, now for a little space of grace had been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape. And then he uses this phrase, and to give us a nail in His holy place. Now there is more that could be said about that nail than what I have time for tonight. So I'm just going to... Dick, you have no idea how hard I'm disciplining myself right now. I'm just going to stick with what the Lord impressed on me earlier. Is that, that that nail, notice where it is. Where is it? Can I just ask you, can you look at your Bibles and use your minds for just a moment? Where is it? In that verse, where is it? You're on it. What you say? His holy place. Oh. <laughs> mm. <laughs> a lot could be said about that nail. Man, you're, you're on to where I'm trying not to go too fast. <laughs> As you see, the Lord has, boom, secured us a place. In his presence. In his holy place. And no one can take that. No one can. It's immovable. Only the hammer that drove it in could pry it out. And that hammer doesn't have a claw on the back. <laughs> Boom. Unmovable. And that nail in this space cannot be removed. 
and as we pray for our nation and as we give the prayer of a patriot, let us remember that God has still given us opportunity. He's not removing the nail. We still have connection with Him and He's still given us opportunity here. But we need to start out with confession. We need to return the oh, the woe, back to our prayer. But we need a place where we can intercede for this land, just like he was looking for someone to intercede for that land. We would come to him with our petitions, and that we would come to him with thanks. Because every time we thank Him, it does a work in praising Him, but it also does a work in reminding us that He's still God and He's still using us and that even though it may look darker, He's not done.